This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The book of Revelation is an informative and edifying study when viewed properly. It has been our goal through the course of this study to enhance what the Lord had to say by bringing clarity to this great book in its reading and in its presentation. It is one book of the Bible that carries with it a stated blessing for reading, Revelation 1 at verse 3. In our study, we're endeavoring to follow through the course of the book by taking a look at a series of sevens that appear. In the opening of the book, there are seven letters to seven churches. And we see this section as beginning with chapter 1, where John is exiled to Patmos, chapter 2, where four of the seven letters are given to the seven churches, and then chapter 3, where the remaining three letters to the seven churches are given. Then in chapter 4, we see God on His throne. After we see God on His throne, we come next to chapter 5, where we enter into a study of the book with seven seals. That takes us to our next series of seven. Under this heading, we have seen that in chapter 5, Christ alone is found worthy to take the book with seven seals. Today, we will begin our study of Revelation chapter 6. In this chapter, six of those seals are open. Now, what this book with seven seals is, is there's a book that has seven seals. Each one of these seals has information contained within it, and as the seal is opened, the information is revealed to the reader. Six of those seals will be opened in chapter 6. Looking a little bit ahead, in chapter 7, there is an interlude for the sealing of the saints. What you see as those seals begin to be opened is there is calamity and war and problem that come, problems that come to earth. But in chapter 7, there's an interlude for the sealing of God's saints to ensure them protection against any adverse effects. Then in chapter 8, we will see the opening of the seventh seal. And with that seventh seal being opened, there will be introduced to us seven trumpets making announcements. The seventh trumpet that makes an announcement will then be followed by seven bowls of wrath. And then we'll conclude our study of the book with the finale in chapters 19 to 22. So for today, we are in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, and we're taking a look as this book that Christ alone was found worthy to take out of the right hand of the strong angel back in chapter 5 and verse 2, Christ's worthiness being emphasized in that chapter. He begins now in chapter 6 to open the seals and to reveal the contents of that book. Before we start opening those seals, let me remind you about John's concern and interest in this book. You remember he is watching anxiously as heaven and earth is sought out for someone worthy to take that book out of the hand of the strong angel. And then when Christ is found to do that, he is quite revealed, quite relieved. Before that, he is weeping because no one was found worthy to take this book. John clearly wants to know what is in that book. And then the anticipation of the reader finds a heightened degree of interest as we follow John, seeing him weeping, but then the elders consoling him and Christ being selected and found to open that book. Now then, in chapter 6, let's begin to open these seals. We will open six of the seals in chapter 6, and John will reveal their content to us. Revelation 6, 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts or living creatures, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. But let's take notice of the artist's conception of this particular seal. This is the section in the book of Revelation where we sometimes have this material referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you're able to see in, these, in this picture the four horsemen as they stand forward. Notice, please, as we continue to read in verse 3, the opening of the second seal. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. 
and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So the opening of the first seal saw this first horse appear, and it was white, and is riding forth, the rider's riding forth, conquering and to conquer, and he is crowned with a crown and has a bow in his hand. As the second seal is opened, here's a red horse. He has the power to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And he has a great sword. Now then in verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast, or living creature, say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Here as this beast is revealing the character to come forth, the third seal is open, and a black horse appears. Well, he has this, these scales in his hand. And you'll notice these scales represent the weighing out of wheat and barley. And these are inexpensive grains. Barley is less expensive than wheat is. But you'll notice they're just being rationed out. And so this particular horse would represent the calamity that would emerge from famine. Then in verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast, or living creature, say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So there you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse depicted, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And as you'll see, there is destruction that is anticipated as these seals begin to be opened by the Lamb or by Jesus Christ. Remember that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ unto his servant John, and that he is communicating this message in signs or symbols, Revelation 1 at verse 1. Now moving to the next seal. We have another picture here as we read, starting with verse 9. I'd like to call to your attention. This is the souls that are under the altar, and we find that they had been sacrificing their, their, themselves or their lives for the Savior. Let's notice in this picture, you will see the souls that are under the altar. In verse 9, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Observe, please, that here you have the souls of those, not the bodies, but the souls of those who had given their lives for the same reason the writer, John, had been exiled to Patmos for the testimony that they held and for the Word of God. As they stood with the truth that Christ is King, they would be sacrificing their very lives. Well, notice too, also, if you will then, as this is the appearance of these souls under the altar, that we will be referencing back to this point in the book of Revelation. Here you find those who are crying out, asking God how long. Now, this is not something that is unknown in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 6, 3, Jeremiah 47 and verse 6 and other verses. We will see that it will be common for people to ask the Lord, How long, O Lord? As in Isaiah chapter 6 at verse 11. They're wanting relief from the burden that they have sensed in striving to serve the Lord faithfully. And each time you will see the phrase, How long, O Lord, made throughout the Bible, you'll know that God's people are undergoing a time of duress. Well, that's certainly true here in the book of Revelation as you see these who have lost their lives wondering how long until their blood is avenged upon those their enemies who are also the Lord's enemies that dwell on the face of the earth. As the next seal is opened in verse 12, here, here you'll find the opening of the sixth seal. And once again, we go to the artist's depiction of this as we read here in Revelation 6 and verse 12. And I saw and beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. 
And lo, there was a great earthquake. If you'll notice in the picture in the center beneath the clouds, there's a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Now you would see the sun turning black. And the moon became as blood. Notice the sun to the left and the moon to the right in the picture presented. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. As a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? A similar pleading is found in the book of Hosea chapter 10 at verse 8, when the wrath of God is coming upon the wicked, and they cry out to be hidden in shame, hidden from the God of heaven as he manifests himself in judgmental power upon the nations. Well, that's what you have here in the book of Revelation. Bear in mind, please, that the mission of the church is to take the good news of the gospel to a lost and dying world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it is the case that those in the first century who were hearing that good news did not receive it into an honest and good heart, as Luke 8, 8 at verse 15 says that we should. But rather they resisted that message, they rebelled against that message, and they even punished to the point of persecuting unto death those who brought them that soul-saving message, the good news of the gospel, that we can be in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with our covenant God. As they reject that message, there are consequences that come to bear upon them that are quite significant in nature. As you see reflected in the opening of this sixth seal and the dramatic presentation that emerges, it is truly a cataclysmic presentation. Now, I'd like for you to notice as we think about this being apocalyptic literature, that is a type of literature where the message is being revealed in various signs and symbols. And that is not uncharacteristic language of apocalyptic literature. It is the case that you can find in the book of Matthew chapter 24 where apocalyptic language is utilized in part as Jesus describes the destruction of Jerusalem. You can find similar wording and language to be found there. It indicates to us the great calamity that will come upon the world as a result of the people's rejection of God and the things of God. God is not immune to imposing His will upon people to their destruction when they repeatedly and defiantly stand in disregard and disobedience to Him. To make the point, maybe, let's move aside to another passage of Scripture that is not apocalyptic and look for just a moment at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 7. In this verse, the Apostle Paul said, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. He says also in that text that he will punish them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints. Now that would be literal language in the New Testament telling us what's going to happen at the return of Christ and the woe and calamity that will come upon the unfaithful who do not obey God. We therefore, as people, ought to take our responsibility to know God and to be obedient to God very seriously. God surely does. Now we've had the opportunity then to see six seals open on this book that Christ alone was found worthy to take out of the right hand of the strong angel in Revelation 5 and 2. And we have seen that with the opening of each of those seals, there, there's very disturbing information that is presented. And as I said at the beginning, we're going to have an interlude in chapter 7 for the sealing of the saints to let the redeemed of God know that God is going to make a surgical strike on his enemies and the redeemed will not suffer because of the outpouring of God's vengeance or wrath upon them. And then we will continue then later in chapter 8 with the opening of the seventh of those seven seals. 
Well, now then, in order for us to strengthen or to undergird the points that we've been striving to make, we'd like to take notice of challenges to what we've just read in Revelation 6. And as I continually say, the greatest challenge that we face in presenting the material of the book of Revelation is a false view, a theory called premillennialism that holds that Christ is going to someday return and premillennialists always find themselves in the generation just before the return of Christ and that there will be a silent rapture, a seven-year period of tribulation on earth, and then there will be a great conflagration they call the Battle of Armageddon. We're going to see what that is as we study later in the book of Revelation, starting with chapter 16. And then there will be a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Now, that's a false view. It is not supported by this book. But there are some very intelligent people who have labored hard and long to try to make that point. What we're going to do now is to examine the writings of some of them. We're going to notice what appears for us in the writings of these people. Now, please bear in mind that the times of the first century were indeed difficult times for Christians, and that's not being denied here as we take notice of their discussion of the seven-year period of tribulation. We do have the backdrop in the first century of difficult times. Let me begin by noticing that with you, not from a premillennialist, but from G.B. Caird's commentary on the book of Revelation. Let's get that now. In his commentary on page 79, Caird says, during the last 35 years of his life, John has lived through a series of grim events which might well seem a challenge to the Christian belief in the kingship of Christ. The earthquakes of A.D. 60, the humiliating defeat of the Roman army on the eastern frontier by the Parthians in A.D. 62, the persecution of the Christians which followed the fire of Rome in A.D. 64, the four-year horror of the Jewish war which ended in A.D. 70 with Jerusalem in ruins, the suicide of Nero in A.D. 60, 68, and the political chaos which ensued as four claimants battled for the imperial throne and for a whole year the Roman world echoed to the tramp of marching armies. The eruption of Vesuvius in A.D. 79 which had obliterated the luxury resorts of the Bay of Naples and created a pall of darkness so widespread that men feared the imminent dissolution of the physical order and the serious grain famine of A.D. 92 according to Suetonius. John's vision of the four horsemen is intended to assert Christ's sovereignty over such a world as that. There were truly problems that were emerging in the first century, a time of calamity. But while they were familiar with those things, the book of Revelation is totally unfamiliar with a seven-year period of tribulation that comes out at the end of time. I wanted to read from Caird's commentary on the book of Revelation to let you know that John was writing to actual people who lived in Asia Minor, who were undergoing the burden of life then and there, and that the things that have been stated up to this point have relevance to the people of the first century. Now, bear in mind that the premillennialists like to tell us that, well, what's in the opening chapters may have had some reference to the seven churches of Asia. But starting with chapter 4 and moving forward, it has absolutely nothing to do with the people of the first century. It all has to do with a seven-year period of tribulation that is going to come after a so-called rapture. Now, with that in mind, I'd like for us to go to the false theory of premillennialism and take a look at their so-called great tribulation. We want to again look at the writings of a person known as Hal Lindsey. He's written extensively on this. He may be the best known among the premillennialists of our day. Let's notice what he has to say about this really being about the Great Tribulation. In his commentary, he has this to say in chapter 5. These seven years, speaking of this Great Tribulation, will be the most fateful in all human history. They are the countdown because at the termination of this period, Jesus will return to earth in cataclysmic personal appearance to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Notice further that he says, During this, this seven-year period known as the tribulation, the human race will witness the most terrible judgments ever to fall on God's creation. Chapters 6 through 19 of Revelation describe in detail the unprecedented horrors of 
this time. Now, he is claiming for us seven years of tribulation to be covered from Revelation 6 through Revelation 19. Therefore, nothing in those chapters can have application to the seven churches of Asia. And when Jesus was writing to John, telling him to direct this message to them, when they would get it, why, they would just be entirely buffooned by it. What does he mean by this? It's not something that applies to us. It's something that's going to come out at the so-called end of time. We have nothing to do with this so-called great tribulation because it doesn't affect us. Who can really believe that about the book of Revelation? This material in chapter 6 through 9 is written as much to the seven churches of Asia as anything else in the book. In fact, as we are seeing, it relates to their times and it is beneficial to them to consider its contents. But let's read further as Lindsay strives to make a seven-year period of tribulation appear somewhere in the book of Revelation. Notice with me, please. He states again in his commentary. This time, we are reading from page 100. He says, but one of the most important reasons for an allotment of seven years for God's final dealing with mankind has to do with an incredible prophecy of Daniel made in the 6th century B.C., Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Please observe that how Lindsay says that Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is an incredible prophecy. Well, the prophecy is incredible as it's presented by Hal Lindsay, that's for sure. But it is very credible as presented by the ancient prophet Daniel in the 6th century B.C. Now, he thinks that in Daniel chapter 9, he can find a week that he wants to make seven years and drop that week into the book of Revelation. Well, let's just study out what he has to say about it and see if he can make his case. And we'll try to present it as clearly as we can from his writings, but I think you're going to see he's going to come up lacking. Before we do that, let's take note of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. In Daniel 9, at verse 24, Daniel said this, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation that the determined, that, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. In Daniel's prophecy, he has reference being made to 70 weeks. Taking a week for a year, you'll have 490 years. He tells us the beginning point, and he tells us the ending point. What I'd like to do now is to strive to make that as clear as crystal, as clearly as we can. Observe the text. Seventy weeks are determined, verse 24. But these weeks are divided up by Daniel in the presentation into seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And then after threescore and two weeks, when the Messiah is cut off, then for one week he will be confirming the covenant and be cut off in the midst of the week. So you'll have one week and three score in two weeks. Those represent, the, week, the one week represents 79 years. Then the next representation of 62 weeks is 434 years for a total of 483 years. Now watch this. Let's find the beginning point for this. Can we know when this is supposed to start? Oh, yes, we can. And Daniel wanted us not to speculate about it, to, to, but to know. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, 
shall be seven weeks. So you begin with the decree that went forward to rebuild Jerusalem. Now it might be helpful for us to get the background information in the book of Daniel to appreciate what is said here. When Daniel himself was taken captive, he was emasculated, that is made a eunuch, and he served in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Now Daniel will remain in captivity for 70 years, but what happened when Daniel was removed from Jerusalem? Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and the people were removed out of that city and from that region and brought over to Babylon. But now, Daniel in this hopeful passage is telling that from the time that there is a decree for the people to return, you can mark from that time 483 years, and then you'll be seeing the appearance of the Messiah the Prince. Well, we know who the Messiah the Prince is, and that is Jesus Christ. All right, let's watch this here. Let's follow this out a little bit. When did that decree go forth? Well, to know when the decree went forth, we can see in the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 that you will find Nehemiah being commissioned to return to rebuild Jerusalem, and that in troublous times. They had to have a means of building in one hand. They had to have a trowel in one hand, as it were, and a spear in the other that they might advance the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. That decree that went forth initially was the decree from a fellow named Artaxerxes Longomanus. That decree went out in 445 B.C. And that is according to Zechariah chapter 8 at verse 5. So you put down a peg in 445 B.C. when the decree went forth and the children of Israel could now return to Jerusalem. They had been told they would be captive for 70 years in Jeremiah 25, 11 and Jeremiah 29 at verse 10. Now then, it's time for them to return home, an event that you can read about in Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. With that decree marks the beginning of Daniel's 70 weeks. We also notice that during that 70 weeks, the things that would happen... You will find here that, that it was determined upon the holy city, a reference to Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. And that's what happens when Jesus gives his life on Calvary, to make reconciliation for iniquity. We can be friends again with God, according to Ephesians 1, because of the sacrifice of Christ, to make an everlasting righteousness. You have the everlasting covenant of our Lord. That's going to be mentioned later in Revelation 14, 6. It's also in Hebrews chapter 13 at verse 20. It would be the New Testament covenant that is an everlasting covenant. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. And he's going to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now notice also that he says the Messiah would be cut off, a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But then he next mentions the destruction of the city and of the sanctuary. And he says wars and desolations are determined. And then he mentions that the sacrifice and oblation would cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Now, in the New Testament, we have the ending point of Daniel's 70 weeks. You have it marked here in verse 27. Remember, we saw that Daniel said there would be a period of seven weeks and then 62 weeks for 483 years. Then he says there will be one week in which the abomination of desolation would occur when the sacrifice and oblation ceased. That, friends, is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, we need to put the ending point on this. We need to put that book in into our consideration. And to do that, we have no higher authority than our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 24. What is Matthew 24 about? It is about the destruction of Jerusalem. And Christ is warning Christians what to look for concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurs when General Titus and his army of 80,000 men invade and destroy finally Jerusalem. You'll remember that G.B. Caird in his commentary mentioned the Jewish wars of A.D. 66 to A.D. 70. He just simply said there were four years war. Well, that's what he was referring to culminating in the destruction of the city. How do you know that that's the abomination of desolation? Because Jesus himself mentions it in Matthew 24, 15. As he is talking about events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. And then he goes ahead to warn them.
Jesus says that the destruction of Jerusalem represents the abomination of desolation prophesied by Daniel. That time period from 445 B.C. when, Artemis, when Artaxerxes Longimaeus gave the decree for the children of Israel to return and rebuild Jerusalem, Zechariah 8, 5, you mark from that date come all the way through the silent years between the Old and New Testaments to the lifetime of Christ up to A.D. 70, and guess what you have? You have 490 years. That's what the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, is about. Now, what our premillennial friends need to have is they need to have seven years of tribulation. They can't get seven years of tribulation out of the book of Revelation. It doesn't mention seven years of tribulation in the book of Revelation. What does it mention? Oh, it'll mention three and a half years. It'll mention 1260 days, but it will not mention seven years of tribulation. Let me read you again from the commentary of Hal Lindsey on this point. Let's go to that now. In his commentary, again he says, this time it is on page 100 of his commentary, in this amazing prediction, speaking of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel set forth a divinely ordained period of time of 70 weeks of years, 490 years, in which God would primarily reach out to the unbelieving world through His chosen people, the Jews. Now watch this remarkable statement. The time period was like a great divine time clock with 490 years of time marked on it. Well, with that observation, we stand in full agreement. We've already noticed that, and we have seen the terminus of that time clock in fulfillment of that prophecy. But now let's read further another statement that Lindsay makes and see what happens to his so-called time clock. Notice, he says across the page, with these events, and the heading is, Israel is missing one week. With these events, God's finger once again pushed in on the divine time clock and the allotted time of Israel's special outreach to the unbelieving world was stopped seven years short of the 490 years. Did you notice that? Seven years short of the 490 years. And that would be the one week. He's saying that week is missing. He has to go to Daniel to try to find a week, bring it over to Revelation, and drop it in here. Does he do that? Friends, I would encourage you to take your concordance and to look under the book of Revelation and see if you can find a week anywhere in these 22 chapters. I don't think you can. I've looked. I've looked several times. In fact, when I was first noticing this, I began to hunt through page by page and verse by verse looking for a week. I could find even a thousand-year period. Again, that's a symbolic period. I could find years. I could find months. I could find individual months. I could find 42 months. I could find days, 1,260 days. But never do you find a week in the book of Revelation. What Lindsay and other premillennialists would like for you to believe is that Daniel's week over here in Daniel chapter 9 is God pressing the snooze button on that prophetic time clock, stopping it at 483 years, transporting over all the centuries and millennia till you get out to the end of time as he anticipates it and then punching the button on it again and letting the last seven years play out in what he calls the Great Tribulation. Now, if it were the case that we could find a week in the book of Revelation, we'd have something to challenge us. But we cannot find a week in the book of Revelation. We can't find Daniel's week there because Daniel's week was fulfilled 26 years earlier from the time of John's writing when Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. Now we're at A.D. 96 and we do not find Daniel's week. It's already been fulfilled and that by no higher authority than our own Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24 at verse 15. What's going on here? there is a diffusion of the prophecy and the time element of it. You'll notice in the Bible, anytime there's a prophecy given and a time element is associated with it, it is bound together and fused to together like metal alloy. It cannot be separated without doing violence to that prophecy. And that's what you have. Daniel put a time element on it of 490 years. Now, if you push the snooze button and you separate that by a great period of time, Daniel is going to be a false prophet. 
Remember that Moses taught in Deuteronomy 18 that if what a prophet said didn't come to pass, he'd be a false prophet? Well, that applies to the prophecy of Daniel. It was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 24 with the destruction of Jerusalem. An illustration of this is given in the Spiritual Sword, Spiritual Sword Quarterly Journal published by the Gatwell Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. In the January 1999 edition of the Spiritual Sword, Brother Hires has this illustration. He says what Lindsay is doing with this time clock being stopped and then restarting is like asking a person, how far is it from Memphis to Los Angeles? And the person says, well, it's 70 miles. It's 70 miles from Memphis to L.A.? That's right, it's 70 miles. Well, how is that? Well, you get in your car and you drive 69 miles and then you stop right there. And you stop counting the miles. You drive another 2,000 miles and then your remaining last mile will take you on into L.A. Now, that's about how ridiculous this attempt at understanding prophecy is by Hal Lindsey, C.I. Schofield, John Valvert, and other premillennialists. You don't stop a time clock and still have prophecy. It is bound together in one. Now then, as we think about these matters, there's one other principle I'd like to present to you, and that is that Hal Lindsey, in Revelation 6, sees destruction and annihilation with the sixth seal. Let me read you a couple of quick quotations as time permits from Hal Lindsey. This is going to be in his book called A New World Coming. He says that in verse 13 of this text, it may be referring to more than ordinary meters. Russia now has a weapon called fractional orbital bomb. You notice this was written some time ago. It consists of a dozen or so nuclear-tipped missiles which can be fired simultaneously from an orbiting space platform. And because they come straight from the sky, they may appear to be like meteors. In another book of his, Planet Earth 2000, he makes the statement, and it's a contradictory statement, on page 259, we're talking nuclear war. And he says, I remain thoroughly persuaded that the world will experience a major international nuclear war during this period. He thinks that's what, that's what John is talking about with the opening of the sixth seal. Now, a couple of pages later, this is page 261 of Planet Earth 2000 AD, he says, in addition to nuclear exchanges, the entire world will be involved in conventional exchange as well. You can't have it both ways. If you're going to have the world absorbed in nuclear war, you can't come back and have a conventional war. But that's how he is confused. He's as confused about that as he is about Daniel's prophecy. Join us again next time as we'll be studying from Revelation 7 and observe the sealing of the saints.